Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm going to start by confessing very openly that my Zoom skills are really rusty. <laughs> so I hope everything goes smoothly, but I'm also uh, really happy to be able to say that my Zoom skills are rusty because having be both of us, uh, Grace and I being in the field of education, we spent several months on Zoom all day, every day, uh, exclusively. And then a year with divided attention between a live classroom of children and a classroom on Zoom. So I, I remember had to hold the day back when you said my my Zoom skills are rusty. I almost said good. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I remember very well the day you ceremoniously deleted Zoom from your computer. Um, it's but back now, but for a very happy reason. It has, it has its purposes. I'm I'm delighted that we can host people from everywhere around the country, um, but it does bring back a little bit of PTSD. Um, so I also wanted to offer a disclaimer about what I think this group is and what it's not. And uh, Grace, you can feel free to comment on this. Um, I am not a literary scholar. I don't know about, I, I don't know a lot about Thomas Hardy's life and history. I don't know a lot about the genre or period in which he wrote. I've read a lot of other authors from that period, but I can't tell you in principle a lot about it. I think probably many of you who are in attendance here, and I know at least one in particular, knows a heck of a lot more <laughs> than I do. Um, so I think um, what, what Grace and I uniquely, I hope, have to offer is just really um, passionate enthusiasm for the books we love. And I hope an ability, well, what we do both professionally is help children develop those that love of books. And through Read With Me, I've been trying my hand at helping adults with that too. Um, so I hope that with our discussion, that's what we'll, we'll be able to do, highlight what we think is significant about it, what the, what the value is to us of reading this book and why we love it so much, and then um, help others through that process too. Does that sound fair? Grace, you, you may know a little bit more about the history than I do, but. Um, I only know what I have found in the notes in the back of my edition. As okay. far as history goes. <laughs> so maybe I'll throw in some fun facts that I learned there, but. Okay. That's all. But that's where they come from. <laughs> I could do a little Wikipedia search on the side, but that, that would be the extent of my knowledge. Yeah. Um, so the way we've decided to go about discussing this is to first take it chapter by chapter and kind of um, highlight and review what we regard as the significant, significant takeaways of those chapters. Now, uh, Grace and I have not had a conversation about this before arriving here. So this is like, it's all happening live right here that she and I are going to basically compare notes on what we think is important um, about chapters one through four. And then at the conclusion of that, we'll step back and take a more global view and talk about, first of all, why she was the one who recommended this book to me in the first place so um, and did so in very passionate terms. So, so she can explain, we can both explain what it is that we love so much about this book. We can explain things we maybe don't like as much about, <laughs> about this book um, and just observations about the general writing style and the tone and um, overall feeling of, of immersing ourselves in this novel. And then once we've finished our kind of introductory conversation, then we'll open up the floor for anybody who wants to um, ask questions, make comments, add observations of your own. Um, this is completely new for me because usually I sit alone in my closet recording studio and, and uh, document my thoughts and then send them out into a void and occasionally get responses in a delayed way on Facebook. So this whole live conversation thing, though I do it with children every day, um, doing, doing it in this format is completely new. I told my kids I was a little nervous about it this morning. And uh, my son's advice was to imagine that you all have the face of Mr. Steele. So just so you know, <laughs> Grace, he thought that it would calm me to picture 30 Mr. Steele faces. I think he thought it would be humorous. <laughs> Mr. Steel so maybe you would just laugh instead of being nervous. <laughs> okay. 
So uh, you ready to get started? I'm so ready. Welcome to our test talk. <laughs> to our test talk. That's right. Okay. So chapter one, um, I did send uh, Grace some kind of talking points in advance of this and just said, okay, here, here are, with no, uh, no descriptions, just here are the topics for each of the chapters as I identified them. And she wrote back and said, my list was basically identical, which I'm not surprised about at all. <laughs> um, so chapter one was John Derbyfield, our introduction to John Derbyfield. And I'm gonna tell a quick story about that. And then I wanna hear what you have to say about putting yourself back to what your first impressions were of John Derbyfield. I know. So one thing I wanted to say, she and I are going to try very hard to do, and I'd like anybody who participates to try to do also, is um, confine ourselves to only what we've read so far. So what, even if you have read the whole book, as obviously she and I both have. So try to put yourself back to what you're thinking, what conclusions you could draw, what observations you made when you had only read chapters one through four, so that we don't give spoilers to people who are experiencing this live along with us and have no idea where things are going to, to go. So I think that'll be a little bit challenging in certain ways, because obviously the, the experience of having read the book puts a filter on the things that we go back and read in the early chapters, but I'm going to do my best to, to to keep myself in the mindset of chapters one through four. Okay, so my quick story. To do my best. Okay, <laughs> and we'll catch each other if we if we err. Um, <laughs> so my story about chapter one is that, as I said, Grace read, loved, uh, highly recommended this novel. So I started reading it and I finished chapter one. And what ends up happening is I'm just like texting her constantly throughout a book uh, she recommended to me as I'm reading it. So chapter one, I texted and I, I texted her and I was like, oh my God, ch chapter one was hilarious. And the response I got was, oh, I can't find it funny <laughs> anymore. And it was like, it, it was that jarring, like, oh my gosh, I have to put myself back into only having read chapter one, because I'm sure you did find it funny. At of the course. Time. But even by chapter four, it's not so funny anymore. And funny enough, I came to this line in chapter four, where it's describing John Derby Field's gate as he's so drunk. And I, I forget what the two cities were, but it's like one second he's walking to London and the other to Bath. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. He, he's, he's staggering and it was a hilarious way of describing it. But then it says, which produced a comical effect frequent enough in families of nocturnal homecoming. And like most comical effects, not quite so comical after all. So, so that's what I think of as chapter one now, comical, but maybe not quite so comical after all. Um, so do you want to talk about your first impressions of, of Mr. Derbyfield? Yes. Um, okay. So of course it is funny when you, when you read it, because you see this man who is drunk, lazy, and he is told that he, uh, is, you know, related to these, these grand, these grand people from history. And he immediately just kind of like stretches out in the flowers, like, oh, my life is so different now. Oh, this matters so much. And even the parson boy, is like, boy. no, it doesn't. Go do an errand for me now. Boy, yeah, yeah. The, the child he's known that entire child's life. Boy, <laughs> that was one of the things I wrote down. I was like making examples of how his behavior changed. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote down, like he calls him the boy, even though he knows his name, mm -hmm. he gives him money to go on an errand, despite the fact that he has almost no money. And, you know, he speaks grandly about how many dead people he's related to who are buried in a vault he's never seen. Mm -hmm. And um, should I give my essential quote or do you want to do that later? Um, no, we can definitely do that um, quickly before we do. So the introduction of him, the first sentence is, the pair of legs that carried him were rickety and there was a bias in his gait which inclined him somewhat to the left of a straight line. He occasionally gave a smart nod as if in confirmation of some opinion, though he was not thinking of anything in particular. An empty egg basket was slung upon his arm, the nap of, of of his hat was ruffled, a patch being quite worn away at its brim where his thumb came in taking it off. So basically I kind of condensed that too. He's a poor peddler. 
we got that from the egg basket and the, you know, worn hat. He's the drunk. He is kind of an empty headed fool. And none of that is said directly, which is one of the stylistic things I think we'll talk about later, but you just get this vivid picture of a person through very well chosen, very well described concrete. So we know we we just know him so well. And then when we wow. have this this discovery of his noble lineage and his reaction to it, um, it it uh, brings brings out more of his character for right. sure. And it's so fun to like parse through. Uh, Thomas Hardy's descriptions of people because they're you know in this book at least they're quite brief but mm-hmm. boy do I feel like I know exactly who that guy is after the first paragraph yeah yeah absolutely okay so let me get my list of quotes and let's see if we chose the same one okay um so the main t- takeaway so what I do when I play this game which ultimately is an imperfect game because sometimes there's a lot of the times there's more than one. Um, but what I'll do is I try to abstract away, look at the chapter and come up with the one thing that if I were to, you know, explain it to someone else, the one thing I wanted them to, to go on to the next chapter knowing. And in this one, my takeaway was, and I'm not sure about the grammar of this sentence, but John Derbyfield's behavior after learning about his noble lineage is impotently superior. <laughs> and just you know he feels superior but there's not really a reason for it and it doesn't mean anything uh, um, so the quote that I wrote down is there is not a man in the county of South Wessex that's got grander and nobler skeletons in his family than I <laughs> And the reason that I love that quote so much is because you could take skillingtons or skellingtons, however it's spelled in your version, you could take it out and leave a blank. Mm -hmm. And anything, anything else that is passed down in a family traditionally could be placed there and it would mean something. Mm -hmm. Jewels, money, like a house, recipes, all of those things mean something. But the one thing you can put there that doesn't mean anything at all is skeletons. <laughs> skeletons. <laughs> okay. So um, isn't oh, there sorry. a question from from Tess in the second? Is it Tess who asked in the second chapter? Um, when she hears the news and she says, Oh, is that good for us? Does that mean something? <laughs> Does, well, and even in this chapter, he asks the parson, what do I do now? Or something like I, that. The parson's like nothing. <laughs> Okay, so interestingly, we did not choose the same um, line, though I 100% see why yours is is probably the better choice, because I think mine is not specifically focused on this chapter, but Mm -hmm. maybe more what we see over the four chapters, Mm -hmm. which is, and what had I better do about it, sir, asked Derby Field after a pause. Oh, nothing, nothing, except chasten yourself with the thought of how are the mighty fallen. So we've already got this uh, this foretelling of doom in that sentence. Mm-hmm. It just sounds like this isn't going to amount to anything for you except disaster right. is, is the implication of it. So, um, And it's really funny that you would say that because I think for each chapter, I was stuck between two hmm. and I was trying to choose the one that embodied the chapter the yeah. best. And yeah. always the other one was one that I felt would be better if we were talking about the book as the a book. whole. The book. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll go on to chapter two. Yeah. So chapter two opens with a description of the Vale of Blackmore. Now, my feeling, no, we, I know we haven't gotten to test yet, but we will in this chapter, but that there was a kind of a parallel between the veil of Blackmore and Tess herself. So just the idea of an- And the white heart legend. Oh, the White House. Yeah, I'll let you talk about that. Okay. Um, an engirdled and secluded region, for the most part untrodden as yet by tourist or landscape paper, the painter, landscape painter. And then, so it's just got this like virginal purity of the land, um, which we'll see parallel descriptions of Tess herself. Well, and the women like in white walking through the town to, or walking on the road as well. I think that that image is really powerful. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, even though it's described as, you know, virginal and pure, it's still so, pardon me, but 
do me like Mm -hmm. (laughs) um the the part with the with the white heart is talking about how you know historically there was some beautiful white deer that the king had spared and then some guy just came in and killed it and it was you know just levied a heavy fine and and that's it and it's kind of like oh okay so it's virginal and pure but also what happens to the virginal and pure here Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and then we had the may day dance after that and again so okay so i we're going to come back and step back and look at things more broadly, but I just want to start to indicate a few things as we go, because I'll put on the table here, there may be people who, who hate this novel already, and I've certainly known many people who, who really just can't stand it because of this, um, because of this doomed, faded, dark, malevolent kind of uh, ambiance we have in the in the whole book. So even here with the May Day dance, one of the things that struck me the most was the the, um, contrast between youth and old age. And it says, um, there were a few, there were a few uh, middle-aged and even elderly women in the train, their silvery, silver wiry hair and wrinkled faces scourged by time and trouble, having almost a grotesque, certainly a pathetic appearance in such a jaunty situation. In a true view, perhaps there were more, there was more to be gathered and told of each anxious and experienced one to whom the years were drawing nigh when she should say, I have no pleasure in them than of her juvenile comrades. So they have, maybe you could say they have better stories to tell when you look at the wrinkled old weathered faces of these old people, but let the elder be passed over here for those under whose bodices the life throbbed quick and warm. So the idea is once you've lived life, you're, you've been beaten down by it. So, so you've got this picture of youth and promise and expectation, and that's what we'll focus on, the beauty of these youthful faces with everything in front of, but then if you look at the faces of the older women, they're weathered and beaten down. That's what we can expect from life. Yeah, it happens to us all in the end. Yeah. Yeah. According to Mr. Thomas Hardy. <laughs> According to Mr. Thomas Hardy. Um, so then we have the introduction of Tess. Um, and you want to talk about first impressions of Tess? I love the way she's introduced. Okay. The lines are amazing. Uh-huh. Um, and immediately it's so clear what he, just like with John Derbyfield, immediately you know her, immediately you understand what all of this is about, uh, or all of her is about. Uh, It says, Tess Derbyfield at this time in her life was a mere vessel of emotion untinctured by experience. So right away you get, she's young and yeah, she's beautiful, but she hasn't had any experiences yet. So she just is, she just has these emotions. Um, And then I also love the line, phases of her childhood lurked in her aspect still. So you get this idea of her complete innocence as well. Um, I remember so I just time that. I read it talking, highlighting, talking about that line with you, you could see that her 12th year in her cheeks, her ninth sparkling from her eyes, even her fifth would flit over the curves of her mouth now and then. What a beautiful way to describe the youthfulness of her face. Okay, now I have an embarrassing confession to make. I um, signed on to my Lisa Van Dam Zoom account which was not an unlimited can- account like my Miss Van Dam school account. And so now I've just gotten warning that I have a 10 minute limit on this meeting. (laughs) So um, what, Joseph, you want to quickly figure out a solution to, do we just sign into, do we just sign off and sign on? Uh, uh, We could do that. I have a, I have an unlimited account. So Uh you could put a, um, I'll put a link to mine. Okay. Give me a second here. I told you my Zoom Uh, Rusty, Grace, <laughs> have the unlimited account. Uh, I'll have to exit the meeting quickly, and I'll get a link for everyone. Okay, sounds good. Sorry, everybody. Gosh, we'll get it all figured out. Um, okay, so Tess, uh, the first images are just this youthful purity, um, and there's something. She's got a special mark on her somehow. She's not, she's not the most beautiful among them, but there's just something, something that drop that sets her apart from the rest. 
Right. And, and it's not like stated explicitly what it is. It's just, he kind of like skirts around it. He talks about the shape of her mouth, right. um, this peacefulness about her. Um, I love the way he introduces her. It's so, so eloquent and well done. But I guess it's both in the description of her and in the first encounter with Angel. Yeah. Um, that we see what's distinctive about her because again, he, she's not the one he chooses but she's the one he's left with after, after he walks away and sort of realizes his mistake. So she, there's that idea that she might not be the first one you notice, but there's something, something. There's something about her that makes him so regretful when he leaves, um, even though he's able to just brush it off like, oh, well. Right. But he immediately picks up on all the things we picked up on. He says something, or when he's thinking to himself, he thinks she's so, um, she's so modest and she is, and she looks so soft in her thin gown. Um, he immediately picks up on exactly what we do, even yeah. though he doesn't have Thomas Hardy explaining it to him. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's a link now, and uh, maybe we should just go ahead and move over there. Um, okay, so um, that any other thoughts about the, oh, and then uh, it says of Angel, he had an uncribbed, uncabined aspect in his eyes, and uncribbed and uncabined aren't regular parts of my vocabulary, but I get the idea, I get the idea. It's like, Mm -hmm. I just said same, but I love that. Um, it's something I've noticed with the other Thomas Hardy works that I've read. He, he likes to put un in front of things. Mm -hmm. He does it a lot. Using words in the negative when they're usually used in the positive. Yes. Right. I'm not sure uncribbed and uncabined are actually used all that often. Um, but so he is, he's unformed in some way he has yet to find the entrance to his professional groove like his brothers it says right yes. um, but the whole power of that first uh scene is just the passing ships like the chance and the, the encounter that didn't quite happen which is what makes it so powerful i think yeah. so for, to have him look back and see her standing there at the gate looking after him as if she we're sorry that he did not choose her and him yeah. thinking, oh, I, I ought to have, but then they move, he yeah, moves on. And, and and that's, that's fate. And this is Thomas Hardy. So yeah. there's nothing to be right. done about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just thought of that as such a quietly powerful little scene. It, I is. Don't know. it really is. Um, I'll say something about that later when we get invite other people in. So anything else about chapter two before we go to three um the thing that i really like about chapter two like i was mentioning before is the test description um mm -hmm. i actually copied it down and i color coded it um because it's really clear that she is all at once like sensually beautiful but also mm -hmm. completely innocent and mm -hmm. so if you take a line like so I did like completely innocent and blue and sensually beautiful in red so if you take a line like Tess Derbyfield at this time in her life <laughs> mm -hmm. ocean, et cetera, blue but then you get to the yeah. pouted up deep red mouth had hardly yet settled into its definite shape the pouted up deep deep red mouth red um yeah. and even at the end when he's looking at her and thinking about how he wishes he would have danced with her he notices what we notice that she's modest and everything, but then he also says that she looks so soft in her thin gown, um, mm. which is red. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that. And there is a lot of talk about Tess's lips in, in descriptions of her. So that's not that's not a very virginal part of her body to give focus, um, and and it, oh, that is given a lot of focus. Um, okay, and then that's funny because we go into chap chapter three and my first point from chapter three was Tess as heart whole and uncorrupted. So once again, so in her encounters with, with the men she dance, dances with, it says she remained with her comrades till dusk and participated with a certain zest in the dancing. Though being heart whole, she's, she's still heart whole and pure as yet, she enjoyed treading a measure purely for its own sake. There's nothing further. 
just dancing for its own sake, little divining when she saw the soft torments, the bitter sweets, the pleasing pains, and the agreeable distresses of those girls who had been wooed and won what she herself was capable of in that kind. How much is there in that line? So she is hard whole. There's the contrast with the other women who have been, who have fallen in love and been wooed by men. And what is the consequence of being wooed by men? Torments, bitterness, pain, distress. <laughs> Those are all the words that, you know, they're softening adjectives to go along with. I was with just going to say, like, yeah, like the sweet torments or something like that, torments. right? I'm not looking at it, but the torments nonetheless. Um, and so there's there's uh, the description of her, the contrast with the other women, and then there's this expectation of how much torment and pain and distress and and bitterness combined with softness, sweetness, <laughs> plus like how much of this to what extent she is capable of feeling all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had that, uh, that line noted for the same reason as you did. Um, just, and I wrote in the margin, she's inexperienced, colon, she's not heartbroken yet. Like she hasn't yeah. had that, she hasn't had that experience that would lend a different meaning to this experience. Right. Um, okay. So then we have Mrs. Derbyfield. Yeah. What do you make of this woman? <laughs> um, She's more sympathetic than, than the father. Certainly, um, which is why it's a little harder to just say definitively because so, there is an element of, of sympathy for her. But at the same time, she just she's just waiting to, to leave, to, to go drink with him. To go to the inn and have her escape. But that image of her rocking the cradle with her foot that has been rocked so much, there are grooves in the floor while she's washing the clothes. With standing her. on one foot. <laughs> It's interesting. It almost feels like what, like she matters less than Tess's reaction to her in that scene. I hadn't thought of that till right now, but, but we, when we see her working so hard, this image of her working so hard, it's not so much that it gives us admiration for her labor. It's just that it makes Tess feel so guilty. She right. And we her, respond to Tess more than we yeah. respond to her. <laughs> And so it's like those hands were the hands that were just washing the white garment that I'm wearing right now. And she feels guilty about that. And her guilt over the, her, her guilt and sense of, of needing to take responsibility over her family, we see is so much of what drives her even in these first couple of chapters. She, yeah. has, to, she has to take care of everybody, including her parents. Well, and even the first thing we hear her say is a defense of her father um, mm -hmm. in chapter two, even though yeah. he doesn't deserve the defense. <laughs> it just tells us how she feels embarrassed by him. him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she takes responsibility for them. But um, so let's see. Um, that I also said, you know, in, we, we get more of Tess in that chapter. It is her taking responsibility, but also her, her strength, her kind of superiority to her parents. She's more educated. She's of a different era. I love that line about the juxtaposition of two eras that when she and her mother are in the same room. Um, and there was this line where it says, I forget what she re was rebuking her mother about, but she says her rebuke and mood seem to fill the whole room and to impart a cowed look to the furniture and candle, the children playing about and to her mother's face. So if we're, you know, bringing together all these various aspects of tests that we've been introduced to, there's the, I think of it as like the mark upon her forehead. There's like something that makes her stand out from all the other women. Um, yeah. There's the pure purity and innocence combined with this sensuality. I'm always now because of you going to think of that as the white dress and the red ribbon, which obviously he intended, but but you've really solidified that in, in my mind. Um, and then there's there's a real like strength and a strength of character in her um, where she's trying always to be the good responsible one in a family where she has to take responsibility for her many her many siblings and uh, her parents too. Yeah, yeah, no, I I 
the the part where Tess goes home and you see the and you see the role that she plays in the house, it's like it's almost like she's the mother that they should have had, but she's their sister. So it's really messed up. Uh, but you see, you know, just how much she feels for the labors of her mother and you see kind of how she tortures herself about it. And it's so, it, 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 she does a really good job of making you feel for Tess in this situation, even though, um, it's such a strange situation. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you really like feel at like closer to her in, yeah, yeah. in that description, I think. Well, and especially in the next chapter. So, okay. And then we have this image of foreshadowing of doom again with, it says the all, the, all these young souls were passengers in the Derby field ship entirely dependent on the judgment of the two Derby field adults for their pleasures, their necessities, their health, and even their existence. So you just see how completely incompetent they are and then this image of them driving the ship that the, that the family is dependent on okay grace we we neglected to say our choice uh essential quote from chapter two. Oh, that's right okay do you want to go first this time sure Tess Derbyfield at this time of her life was a mere vessel of emotion untinctured by experience. That was what I mean, it, it, it was it the same one. Yes. So, okay. I chose that one and then I did end up changing it just at the last second because the main takeaway from the chapter for me was the sensually beautiful, but completely innocent bordering on naive. So at first I chose that, but I didn't think it included anything about the beautifulness. Um, mm -hmm. So I changed it to, as she walked along today for all her bouncing, handsome womanliness, you could sometimes see her 12th year and her cheeks. Oh, Yeah. Because yeah, I just I don't got better at encapsulating the, her internal contrast. <laughs> Agree. That's fantastic. Okay, well, I think we're done with chapter three, too. So what okay. was your quote from chapter three? So my takeaway is that the Derbyfield home is not happy or well run. Uh, <laughs> and so I felt that the line that best encapsulated that was if the heads of the Derbyfield household chose to sail into difficulty, disaster, starvation, disease, degradation, death, thither were these half dozen little captives under hatches compelled to sail with them. The one we were just talking about six helpless creatures yeah. who had never asked for life on any terms, much less if they wished for it on such hard conditions as were involved in being of the ship, the shiftless house of the Derby fields. So it's a okay. long line. That's my choice. Yeah, well, <laughs> and mine was all these young souls were passengers in the Derby field ship. So really you have to take a couple of lines and put them all together, but it was the same idea. Well, and I think uh, I'll just like one long sentence too. I was like, I don't know where to stop. <laughs> this is Thomas Hardy. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So chapter four, the inn. Um, there's a lot you could say about the inn, but the first thing I just want to say is I feel like I have been there. <laughs> I mean, when I, and when I went back and read this again, it was like, oh, I'm going back to, to visit a place that I've I hung out and had a drink. I mean, it just, there's something about his descriptions that made going up that staircase with her calling down her catechism. I forget the words of it exactly, but <laughs> trying to cover their tracks and say, it's just a few friends, you know, since I had a few friends over here. Um, I found that whole exchange hilarious. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the, the inn, as you mentioned before, is the place where Miss, where the Derby Fields go to escape the cares of life because life is is dreadful and and miserable and oppressive. And when and the end of it, you just warned them. Yeah, and this description of of the place where people escape from the cares of life, the stage of mental comfort to which they had arrived at this hour was one wherein their souls expanded beyond their skins and spread their personalities warmly through the room. 
In this process, the chamber and its furniture grew more and more dignified and luxurious. The shawl hanging at the window took upon itself a richness of tapestry, the, and so on and so on, until it was all the pillars of Solomon's temple. Um, but there's something so powerful in that description and so kind of sordid and tragic <laughs> at the same time. They have to have, be in a haze of drunkenness to turn their environment into something with any pleasure or dignity to it. Yeah. With um, the very first time I read this book, I listened to it on audiobook. Like I would listen to a couple chapters while I was getting ready in the morning. And then I would go back and I would read the chapters with more focus later. And I just remember like putting on my mascara during this description and just being like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what's the point of doing my makeup right now? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I mean, what else do we want to say about uh, the, the image that stands out for me is John Derbyfield sitting there drunk, repeating the story of this discovery of his noble lineage, even to his wife, not really seemingly aware that it's to his wife that he's talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a drunken blathering repetition of something that he's trying to take pleasure and pride and satisfaction in, and really amounts to nothing at all. Yeah, it's, it's sad. Yeah. That's such a not insightful way to say it, but <laughs> it doesn't need to be. It's sad. <laughs> um, and then it gets worse. So yeah. Um, then chapter four, of course, ends with the delivery of the beehives. Did we have any doubt that Tess was going to have to be the one to make the delivery? No, no, he'll he'll take care of it. And then I don't, there's, again, there's so many images that for me are so powerful and memorable and stark, even though they're so simple. So her sitting up in bed aware, it's been like two hours and mm -hmm. she has to kind of summon, summon consciousness and quickly take responsibility for this situation when she can barely, you know, get her mind in focus again. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, but then of course, this is where we see her kind of strength and her sense of res responsibility over her family that she's going to be the one to, to, and also a sense of pride that she doesn't want to ask other people to do things. And she's embarrassed when her father passes by and makes a fool of himself. So there's, there's a, a sense of pride that she holds that just makes her admirable too. But so, you know, she takes takes responsibility here. And then there's the image, even just of bringing her little brother along and he's in that sleepy haze too until he yeah. eats some bread and butter and then he starts to wake up again. And, and then the, the kind of childish observations he makes of the world around him. And there's, there's just something so, so vivid and real about that scene, which I guess just contributes to the horror of what is- Of the accident. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it's, it's just, it is horror that scene. He is unsparing. It's so that he makes it. And it's interesting that it's that, that it's that way as well, because we've been talking about how he gives such brief and he gives such brief descriptions that give you a great idea, but they're not very, um, very visual. Like, mm -hmm. like they are and they aren't, they're not extremely well, detailed. Um, I, can I say something about that though? Cause that's, so if someone were to say, I hate this novel, I think what they would say they hate about it is that everything is, that so much of it seems like the ship moving beyond their control. Everything is this dark, malevolent, faded atmosphere. And you, you see the characters having no control over what happens. So. Now, wh what I can say about that is if that's your view of life and if that's the meaning you're trying to convey, it's hard to imagine doing it more powerfully than a scene like this. Mm -hmm. she, the horse ends up dead with a like spike through its heart. Right. And it happened without her even being aware of it. So there's there's not a little bit, of, there's not description. It's some it's a disaster that happens passively. Mm -hmm. every, every and that seems to be so much of the feel of this novel is yeah. disasters happen passively and She's that's what I was going to say is that it's 
it's interesting that the like the descriptions of the characters and the environment are so like you get a lot out of them but they're but they're brief and then with this it's just like so much vivid detail of like the the horse being impaled and the blood on her dress and just every little inch of it is described all the way so the, the after effects are described in detail the action itself happens while she's asleep right. she doesn't know she doesn't really know what's happened until she goes to investigate yeah and then like there's this sense of like something as soon as she starts to kind of fall asleep and you can kind of tell, oh, she's, she's falling asleep. She's dreaming. You're like, wake up, wake up right now, wake up <laughs> because you Absolutely. know, something terrible is going to happen. But when there, what was flitting through her mind as she was falling asleep also was, let's see if I can find those lines quickly. Um, Okay, examining the mesh of events in her own life, she seemed to see the vanity of her father's pride, the gentlemanly suitor awaiting herself in her mother's fancy, to see him as a grimacing personage, laughing at her poverty and her shrouded knightly ancestry. And this is all of what, like all the situation that we're in with all its sense of foreboding doom is what she's thinking about as she falls asleep and then disaster strikes. Um, so, and also just before that, it says, uh, the mute procession past her shoulders of trees and hedges became attached to fantastic scenes outside reality and the occasional heave of the wind. Now, how many ways might one describe the heave of the wind? It could be something very beautiful, right? The heave of the wind became the sigh of some immense sad soul, conterminous with the universe and space and with history and time doesn't get much more malevolent and dark right. than that. Um, um, well, it's a blighted star, so. The blighted star, is that your quote for chapter four? Yes. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tis because we be on a blighted star and not a sound one, isn't it, Tess? Murmured Abraham through his tears. And it is. Okay, so we find ourselves on a blighted star and you and I revel in every moment of it. How do we make sense of that? So I think we need a segment of each episode. Like, yes, it's terrible. Like this segment is called, yes, it's terrible. Now, why do we love it so much? Right. Um, so why do we love it so much? Um, I think part of it is what I just said, that what I guess much of what I gain from great literature is kind of epistemolo psychoepistemological. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if that's quite, quite, if there is quite a word for it. It's the experience of looking at the world through a, through a lens of brilliance. And if it's very, if it's, even when it's very much at odds with my view of the world and my sense of life and my philosophy, if, it gives me that feeling of a clarity of vision, whatever vision that might be, there's a profound enjoyment I get in the experience of that and an elevation and an improvement as a person, I think, because it helps, I mean, we, I could talk for too long about that, but it helps sharpen my, I just feel like it helps me and my capacity of sharpening my vision and outlook on the world and there is it's not something i'm conscious of it's just a feeling of satisfaction of looking at the world with that kind of a clarity even if i think it's misguided philosophically right it informs your own perspective even if you're like okay not that that's not my perspective <laughs> yeah it, in, it informs it but that's almost like the second that's like the next step yeah um, um the first step is just the sheer pleasure of experiencing the world with this clarity of vision, this consistency and clarity of vision. There's a, there's a profound pleasure in that for me. And tragically, I mean, I, I wish, imagine Thomas Hardy, were he to have a more benevolent outlook. <laughs> I mean, the power of the descriptions, the beauty of the descriptions, the poetry of the descriptions, it's just sometimes outrageously beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I take a, a real pleasure in just taking in the, the, the kind of flow and beauty and per perception and precision of the language. Mm -hmm. um, 
I just, you know, would like to see it in more benevolent hands. Right. Can I share my weird metaphor? Sure. I think oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Metaphor. So I was talking with Lisa recently and I was like, I don't know how to describe the way that I feel about Thomas Hardy in, in terms other than other than this. I feel as though when I'm reading a Thomas Hardy novel, I am a fish swimming through very murky water and I can see a shiny lure somewhere ahead of me amidst the murk that is being slowly but deliberately dragged away and I just have to pursue it. <laughs> that is how I feel reading Thomas Hardy. <laughs> So what it, the the murkiness is the spirit of the novel because it's not obviously the lack of clarity. Um, right. So you know, this murky spirit, but there's something. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, there's something in the plotting uh, that makes you feel like there is always something just out of reach, and you have to find out what that thing is. There's like. Uh, teasers planted to make you always wonder what's coming around the corner. There is. And it's like, you can see doom coming from like a hundred miles away in this novel and in other novels by him that I've read. And somehow he manages to keep you hoping that it's not going to happen, even though you know it is right mm -hmm. until the moment when it happens. And even though you see it coming, it feels just as shocking, just as heartbreaking. True as if yeah. you hadn't seen it coming at all. And it somehow makes the novel better that you have seen it coming. Yeah. Okay, I would like to open the floor unless, um, oh yeah. That, so the one question that I saw was from Anu on the Facebook group and she said, she asked if the novel was deliberately funny. And I thought there were a million parts that were deliberately funny, but in that funny, not funny part. Usually it seemed like it was either kind of just a wry description like an enjoyment of putting something in a clever way that sort of humor like the um, eclipsing often, girl. what's that like the eclipsing girl whose name yes. was not handed down yes. grace and i were talking about the person angel chose to dance with and he says the name of the eclipsing girl has not been handed down in history there was there was no need to explain it that way but it just there's a cleverness in it that's delightful and even a little bit hard to explain what's so funny about it but it was funny um but most of the humor was in that um the descriptions of of the father's drunkenness for example were often very funny but also there's something tragic and sorrowful underneath it and I think that was true of most of the humor in the chapter yes that's true of Thomas Hardy <laughs> okay, um, we've got some comments and questions in the chat, but also please at this point, I guess, Joseph, you're the host, so you'll have to. Um, I think people can unmute themselves, but maybe um, just raise your hand and then I'll uh, yeah, if you wanna, at least if you wanna, I recall. If you want to yeah, raise there's a reactions button in the bottom, bottom bar. Uh, Caleb, go ahead. And uh, you can unmute yourself as well. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, um, I, I really was struck by the um, when they lost the horse. Then he talks about how uh, the family didn't like suffer over it as much as someone with oh, much more would have suffered over the loss of something so like much less meaningful. So they lost absolutely everything, but their lives are in this mesh of pain that they exist in every day. And they're like, okay, well, we don't have a horse anymore. You know? Yeah. It's like, that was crazy. Um, it. I, I love that you bring up that line because that that is that does to me capture one of the things I love about the novel and what's so powerful for it is that I, when I was reviewing this chapter in preparation for this discussion, Later that afternoon, my uh, soon-to-be son-in-law asked me a question. We were talking, I can't, can't even remember what we were talking about. And he said, but he said something like, well, do you think it bothered these people less than these other people because they've been through so much um, sorrow and tragedy in their lives already? And I was like, oh my goodness, do I have a line from you? From you? And I ran and grabbed the book and read him that line. And it was just, it was this sharpening lens again that that he had captured that so so powerfully. And then sure enough, it comes up in conversation that very day. So yeah, thanks for drawing attention to that one. I found that very powerful too and useful in conversation, not hours later. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Kathleen has her hand up as well. Uh, uh, Kathleen, you're on mute. Hi, good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, I have to say I'm really enjoying the book so far. I've not read it, so I'm a okay. first timer to the book. Okay. Um, a couple just quick first impressions that I have. You both have mentioned this, but I love the descriptions of the characters. When I close my eyes, I instantly get it. I mean, I can just visually picture these people, even with just a couple sentences. Mm -hmm. I also did read the back of the book that I have, you know, the jacket on the back of the book. And it mm -hmm. mentions a despicable act that Tess has done. And I'm thinking, what has she done? Did she murder someone? Did she, you know, what did it, anyway, I'm really curious to know about what this despicable act is. That's okay, well, let's just, book. let's get if, if erase. I wish I had the men in black tool right now. Okay, like, all right. Erase uh, somebody's never, but um, it's funny because Grace and I have this, <laughs> we have this discussion constantly where we tell our students, don't read the back of the book, never read a, an introduction. An introduction is a conclusion, never meant to be an introduction. Don't even read the back of the book. And so we've talked about, papering over the backs of the books, except that we know with student psychologies, that's only going to make it all the more tempting for them to read <laughs> if we paper it over. So it's a losing battle. We're just going to have to start tearing the back covers off of our books. But anyway, um, it's, uh, it, it's I, I completely understand your curiosity because she is a good character. How can she commit an act that's despicable and maybe that's written in a way that's misleading we'll just leave it at that <laughs> and she does think well, that, she, that she murdered that horse yeah too she late does. now I've, I, too late now i've already read it but i can go ahead and tape over it again i can tape it yeah. over but it, it, it happens, <laughs> i, know, I understand but but also just just for your own sake think of it as written in terms of broad abstractions that are left very widely open to interpretation and um, so you won't you won't know what it means until we until we get there. Okay. Um, any other? Oh, Joseph, we got some other comments. Yeah, Stefan. Sorry, I hope I said your name right. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody. Can you hear me well? I don't know if my yes. microphone is okay. Terrific. Yep. Um, I just want to say it's nice meeting you all. I've been. Uh, studying objectivism now for about five years and finally getting into the community. So um, I just wanted to say, uh, I agree with your whole thing about uh, not reading descriptions because um, like when I watch a TV show, I don't like when they show the next week, mm. uh, what they're gonna talk about or uh, even movie trailers. I just like to stay away from that stuff because I like to be completely uh, surprised. So anyways, I just wanted to comment on the beginning, the very beginning. Okay. Um, I really liked how quickly the author naturally plunges us into this universe. Mm. Instead of a narration setting up the history, he uses a simple conversation to catch us up on the past and made us curious of what the implications would result from this new information. So I just thought that was really well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's even more true in retrospect, having read the entirety of the novel. So. Um, I think you'll, I think you will like chapter one even more when the farther along we go in the book. That was my experience. Same. Yeah. Good. I do. Thanks. Um, I have a comment about Tess herself. Um, mm -hmm. I think she's quite an amazing character in many respects, but um, what you just said, Lisa, about her murdering the horse, of course, she did not murder a horse. She right. was put in an awful situation where her parents should never have put a, what is she, 16, 17 at that point, yeah. in the middle of the night. But she takes that all upon herself. She actually right. does think that it's her fault. And you right. see that even later on. Everything that befalls on her is somehow her fault. Yes. And she doesn't see the similar fault in other people. I mean, they have bigger issues for parents to begin with. But she somehow doesn't only, she's the only, um, sorry, I'm not putting this very well, but how can, is it possible for somebody to think that all the blame is on yourself and nothing on anyone else? Because right. that seems to be her 
a character trait almost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I have to be careful because I think of it just in terms of what's going to happen. Think in just humans. about the horse, okay? Think yeah, always think about just, the horse. No, but just the next couple of pages, um, I'm violating Stefan's rule even to just say the next couple of pages. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, there is um, that it's a little bit feels to me again like that mark upon her forehead she just seems to have this strength and to view everybody around her as incompetent and weak which they are but she easily could be too but instead she says everybody around me is incompetent and weak i have to be the one to carry this load so she's always they're not strong enough they're not strong enough i'm always going to be the one who um who takes who has to go to the inn and even fetch the drunk parents. You know, she even tries to send her little brother to do it and he just ends up sitting on the stairs. So she always has to be the one to take responsibility. Um, and I agree, I had that same feeling reading these first few chapters is there's something kind of staggeringly impressive that I guess I say the mark on her forehead because it just defies her environment. It's, it's so out of place in her environment that she has this strength um, that nobody else around her seems to have. Yeah, and she tries to have a little bit of fun when she goes out with the women uh, frolicking around and then she comes back home and feels immediately that she should have been there helping her mom. And then right. we learn that the mom is really avoiding doing anything herself. Right. Except maybe having a drink at night. <laughs> right. Um, and the little bit of fun just makes me think of the emphasis on that, the youthful, the, the child, childish soul that's still within her, that she's trying, it, it's there and it's an important part of her, but we just immediately see it being eroded and challenged and, and like yeah. killed in her, basically. Yeah. Everything we see happening is killing that like, pure benevolent spirit. Um, I don't know, Grace, if this is where you want to bring in Wordsworth, but I, um, one of the things that I Googled while I was uh, reading these first few chapters was, is uh, Thomas Hardy influenced by um, Rousseau? Because there seems to be that Rousseauian, like, you know, purity and connection to nature and, you know, innocence and that's un innocence and purity means lack of corruption by society and to the extent that society is is kind of imposing upon her she's becoming corrupted I don't know if he's influenced by Rousseau but there is this reference to Wordsworth um so we do have the romanticist uh um I kind of idealization of of purity and nature rhetoric. yeah but it almost and maybe I I didn't I didn't fully understand the reference. And so I was like comparing the paragraph that it's in to the poem and the verse that he, the stanza that he quotes is the one at the very end of lines written in early spring by William mm -hmm. Wordsworth. He says something about nature's holy plan. So the stanza right. is, if this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? Um, and I have to find the bit in the book. Yeah, and I know what was confusing about it. Find it. But I know what was confusing about it was that, that Thomas Hardy made it sound like the poem talks about this view of nature's plan in a way that gives you the sense of the benevolent expectation of nature's plan. Mm -hmm. But look at the look at the reality that Tess is in. There's no benevolence of nature's plan. But mm -hmm. then you read the poem. And the poem is really saying that man is thwarting the benevolence of nature's man. So it's of, of nature's plan. So mm -hmm. it seems like they're not actually at odds with each other. It seems like they're consistent <laughs> with each other. Yeah. So, that would, so, but maybe he's just because it says some people would like to know whence the poet whose philosophy is in these days deemed as profound and trustworthy as his verse is pure and breezy gets his authority for speaking of nature's holy plan. Mm. Um, so and so he the nature's holy plan is that, you know, nature is peaceful and beautiful and man just messes it up um, mm. or man can't live up to it. Mm. But he seems to disagree with, or at least in this line, um, disagree with the idea that nature's holy plan is peaceful at all. Nature's holy plan is disaster, starvation, disease, degradation, and death, apparently. Not uh, 
I have the poem here. So it is not the budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air. And I must think do all I can that there was pleasure there. Okay. okay. <laughs> so it's just contrasting the, the, so in Wordsworth, he, basically he wanted to use the phrase nature's holy plan. So that's why he chose that particular phrase from Wordsworth, but the spirit of a Wordsworth poem is, you know, immersion into the beauty of nature and the holiness of nature, nature being like a temple. Um, right. And so he's contrasting, using contrasting images that here, nature is not a holy temple. It is a no. dark and malevolent place. Um, Where the people who drive shapes are- I have a quick question. Yeah. So I don't think either of you mentioned the scene between uh, or of the noble boy, Again, I don't know if we heard his name. But, you know, when the uh, when they're dancing and the three young men come by and one of them. So I don't know. You guys didn't comment on that scene, or uh, I don't know if it had no significance, or if we oh. we're just going to have to wait. No, we did comment on that. I'm not sure. Oh, maybe that was in the transition. Oh, that might have been in the transition. So okay, no, okay. that never mind. No, I <laughs> I describe that as a quietly powerful and really significant scene because it's almost it almost feels more significant because they didn't meet <laughs> there was just something right. maybe that's part of the shiny lore <laughs> Grace is like that's well, it. wait yes. a second There's yeah because that's what I was like oh this is going to be a good story they're going to mm -hmm. they're going to have happily mm -hmm. ever after that's what uh, I'm <laughs> okay but now okay. I'm not so sure that's not <laughs> now that the funny thing I was there. Well, no, I oh. can't say anything about it. Never mind, spoiler. <laughs> Stopping myself. The thing that um, I like so much about, um, well, there's so many things, but uh, like it seems as though every detail that you see in each chapter is kind of contributing to this feeling of the the wheels of fate slowly yeah. turning, and you can't you can't move it one direction or another. So the fact that they didn't meet, um, like there's you know, just what Angel says as he's walking away, like there's nothing that could be done. Oh, well. And he yeah. just kind of brushes it off and runs away. It's like this, this wheel of fate thing, just slowly, determinedly going, going, yeah. you miss something. Yeah, well, I, you miss something. I, put, I, I commented in my notes that it seems like all of life is like that sleepy carriage ride. <laughs> like it's literal wheels. <laughs> You're just riding along on a carriage. Yes. And in the darkness and something bad happens. And the thing uh, that, oh, yeah. Never mind. I was going to say something, but it might be a spoiler. Uh, it's, it's always <laughs> a hazard. So Yen comments in the chat that disasters happen when you drift seems to be the theme of the novel so far, um, which is interesting. Is it always, are disasters always happening when people drift? Um, I don't know because I feel like if she, I guess there's no there's no contrasting feeling of agency. That's the thing. Yeah. Like who are the ones that are not? <laughs> I yeah, mean, it seems like everybody is more or less. It's not that they're drifting in the sense that that's a condemnation of them. Right. Tess seems like a strong mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. who who wants to do what's right and isn't, but and she falls asleep because she's had two hours of sleep because of her drunken father. Mm -hmm. um, but so I guess it it's not drift in the sense of you fail to take responsibility for yourself. It's just like drifting is a metaphys drifting is metaphysical. It's just part of that's how the, the universe. Like everybody's is. drifting, but your course is predetermined. Right within the, yeah. So it's like, I guess, on the ship, you might be able to take certain actions that are um, within your control that you have agency over, but the ship itself, it's that's, going. Moving, that's moving without any, um, without any, uh, you have no control over that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any other, let's, let me just check. Stefan has his hand up again. Okay. I have a question it's pretty much on the topic you guys are talking about um would you say the difference between a novel that is deterministic um versus a free will you know um where you have agency behind the plot would you say the difference is that the characters are moving 
the plot versus the universe is moving the plot because it seems because when I listen to Leonard Peikoff talk about great art, he mm-hmm. says you know there's nothing accidental in art, and that mm-hmm. you know it's it's almost as if what happens you know, needs to happen in a way. It almost sounds deterministic, but it's it's I guess it's what's driving the plot is what's important. Is that correct or? Yeah. That sounds about right. That sounds right to me. And in the simplest terms, is it just the do are the characters moving the plot? Are the characters is are the consequences to them driven by them? Um, and here it feels so far very much like it is not. <laughs> um, Molly and Steve had a great comment. Um, yeah, interesting that Hardy doesn't start a new chapter between the drunk night and the two in the morning trip indicating mm. it's all blurred together mm. there's no kind of break in that um, so are are we we a little drunk in that <laughs> <laughs> and so we're just sort of living those moments um any other comments or questions i have a few more things in my note i know we should wrap up soon um so i guess i think we did i think we came around to stressing the things that are most important. Um, the you know general malevolence of the universe we've found ourselves in. You know, you mentioned just to, uh, as another example of that. I thought to myself at one point that joy is almost a pretense. There's there's the brief moment of childhood joy before you're un unco- while you're uncorrupted that there can be kind of a purity of joy. But after that, it's it's there's something false about it. So there's that May Day dance and it describes from a distance, it's this beautiful scene, you know, pastoral scene with all these women in white dresses. But when you cut, get close, it says ideal and real clashed slightly as the sun lit up their figures against the green hedges and creeper laced house fronts. For though the whole troop wore white garments, no two whites were alike among them. Some approached pure blanching, some had a bluish pallor, some worn by the older characters, inclined to a cadaverous tint, <laughs> to a Georgian style. <laughs> so like, it might seem, um, you know, blissful and, and idyllic from a distance, but look close and you see the tinge of death <laughs> in mm-hmm. the whiteness yeah. of mm-hmm. their garments. <laughs> Um, there was a quote that I read from Thomas Hardy, uh, about his own writing. And he talked about, um, he talked about finding the, uh, the grave within the beautiful and finding the beautiful mm. within the, within the grave. Mm-hmm. And I think that we can find examples of that. And I think that's one of taking something that's beautiful, you know, these women wearing white and going down the country lane. Um, but if you look closer, you'll realize it's not actually that like there, it's not pure beautiful. There are things in there that are, mm-hmm. that are not, that are more mundane or mm-hmm. in this case, cadaverous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just an interesting thing to contrast with someone like Hugo who loves to, you know, juxtapose the grotesque and the beautiful, with the motivation for that it seems so psychologically <laughs> so worlds apart okay. um, and uh there's just such a sense of like be- benevolence and belief in the grandeur of human beings and hugo's universes and even though we there's tess is an admirable character but i think I don't know. I'd like to hear what other people think about this. Did you come away? I think I came away feeling more like pity because of her strength rather than admiration for her strength. It's like, oh God, she's so great. And look where she lives, how she lives and what it seems like is always going to happen to her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, Caleb had a really good, uh, I think he was drawing this metaphor for connection the description Mm -hmm. of the horse standing until it couldn't stand anymore uh, as noble and impactful and also i'm assuming foreshadowing tess uh, Mm -hmm. now as well um, Mm -hmm. because she's got that same sort of strength and nobility Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now i don't want to know what else happens okay um it looks like we have some more hands too yes oh Oh, molly and steve yeah hi 
Thank you for this wonderful discussion. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point out another shining lure for you, little fish. Uh, <laughs> will, uh, kind of take us away from the doom and gloom and fatalism. Hardy does have this little bit of, of um, hope of a more benevolent universe, I think in this one paragraph in mm. uh, two. And as each and all of them were warmed without by the sun, so each had a private little sun for her soul to bask in. This is when they're in the May Day dance. Some mm -hmm. dream, some affection, some hobby, mm -hmm. at least some remote and distant hope, which though perhaps starving to nothing, still lived on as hopes will. Only in Hardy. Yes. Only in Hardy would that be the well, hope. That's your, little, your lure. He's luring you along with that yeah. little, little yeah. son. It's because they're still young. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, Joseph, you want to call someone yeah. else? Caleb's got his hand up next. Um, yeah, so I want to go back to the whites thing. Um, uh -huh. I thought that was really a great way to demonstrate um, the individuality of all these people. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, I work with colors a lot. So it's, you know, super obvious to me that no two whites are going to be the same. And for him to point that out in such a way, that, like, you know, gives like, they didn't all go out and buy uniforms. They had to find these whites. And in this time, it's like, oh, I have something white. That's amazing. I mean, in the end, at the on the fourth chapter, like she gets drenched in blood. And did she expect that? You know, like mm -hmm. things happen. Your whites just don't aren't white anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was a really great description of, of the individuality of all these women who are joined in a form but uh, completely unique. Yeah, I think I mean, part of it is just, I think you could take a lot of little details, extract little details from Hardy and say, why is that in there? And if you look at it in particular in isolation, you won't really have an answer. And then when you have the experience that I did where you come back to this inn, and this inn is a real place to you. You feel it. You've been there. You know exactly. There are some details where he just seems to me like a master of knowing just how many details you need to include just to turn this into something that's really vivid and you're really present and you're really there. So that's one aspect of it. But also there is, so sometimes I think it falls into that category, but here the fact that he started with ideal and real clashed slightly, just seems like he's drawn a little line under, you know, oh yeah, it's really a pretty innocent, you know, pure, happy scene, but come on, let's look a little closer. <laughs> it's like, it really um, undermining the ideal, which he does consistently <laughs> throughout this, throughout these chapters. Um, so, it would be interesting to pick other lines in future chapters and say, okay, is this there just to give, you know, tangible reality to this scene or is there symbolic significance in it? And sometimes I think it'll be hard to tell which is which, but I, th I think definitely think there are both distinct categories. And I think that I totally agree that with um, everything that you see in this novel, he does juxtapose kind of like the, uh, well, not everything, but when he when he does it, it's a juxtaposition between the ideal and not so much. He does that with a lot of things, but with the, the, the notable exception is within Tess herself. She, hmm. I think, is ideal. And, you know, the, the subtitle of the book is a pure woman. Like pure woman. she is pure. And even, um, I was wanting to bring this up and this is a good moment too. Uh, even when it turns out that she's going to be the one that has to deliver the beehives, uh, her, and she's talking to her mother about it. <sighs> Pardon me. She's talking to her mother about it. Um, Mrs. Derbyfield says, uh, that she should get someone else to do it. Some young feller perhaps would go one of them who were so much <laughs> after dancing with you yesterday. 
And that's clearly a suggestion that she used her beauty, her feminine wiles to get what she wants, but that doesn't even occur to Tess. The thing she says is, oh no, I wouldn't have it for the world and letting everybody know the reason. She's not against using her feminine wiles because it doesn't even occur to her to do that. Mm -hmm. The thing that she gets upset about is suggesting that she go tell somebody about her drunk father because she's, you know, she has pride. She doesn't want to do that. Um, so it doesn't even occur to her that she could use that beauty to get what she wants because she is a pure woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian has to I'm just saying, I think she's the notable exception to yes, yes. flashing the ideal and the not so ideal. I sense that this almost reminds me of um, Anne of Green Gables and the, the where they switch perspectives. The, um, the observant uh, person might notice this. The optimistic person might notice this. And so I feel that on, I think almost everything in life, if you wanted to look below the surface, you go to a school dance and you might stand back and say, oh, the prom looks so beautiful, all these wonderful dresses and so forth. But then when you actually dive into it, you notice that there are a lot of lonely people standing at the sides, nervous, they're never going to get asked and someone's got a stain they're trying to hide on their dress. And so I think there's kind of like a, uh, there, there are different levels of perception always. And, and Harvey's just making us constantly aware of it by flipping back and forth. And I don't know that it necessarily strikes me as being pessimistic or, or tragic in any way. It's more um, edifying. Oh, wow. I, I wouldn't necessarily be simultaneously aware of both of those perspectives. And I especially like the fact that Tess doesn't seem to be to feel like she is hard put upon. She seems to accept her lot in life. And I I don't even know if it's stoic if in as much as if this is the only life she knows, it's not as though she's necessarily comparing herself and saying, oh, woe is I, how could I possibly have landed such a lousy situation? I feel that she has, she, she is kind of taking that optimistic thing. I'm going to enjoy the dance. I'm going to think wistfully of this guy this lovely fellow who passes I'm going to boldly go and talk to him I'm going to take responsibility to take care of the beehives and get my parents after they've abandoned me so I really feel this is an optimistic first four chapters I don't see the negativity that you're all seeing <laughs> well um it's funny because I used to do movie discussions with um Jeremiah Cobra and often there would be somebody who would comment on the movie in a way that I would say, well, I would love to see the movie that you're talking about. It's not the, it's not the one I saw, but I'd, I'd really enjoy it if it were. But I, I mean, the thing is like to compare this with Anne, if Anne were watching that dance, the difference in the colors of white would not enter into her into anywhere into her frame of awareness. She would be emphasizing and highlighting and um, exaggerating every aspect of beauty and perfection she could find within it. Um, and Hardy, so Claire, that would work. To a cadaver. Yeah, he, she wouldn't compare it to, to a <laughs> cadaver. Um, but the, you, you described something about it being, I don't think clarifying was the word you used, but something to that effect. And that I definitely feel, but it feels to me very much through a lens of malevolence. And Tess, I don't know how, I, I don't know if I would describe her as stoic, but I definitely don't think of her as like blithely accepting her lot in life and just saying, okay, sure, I'll take the beast. She always seems sort of stupefied at her, the embarrassment of her parents at what she has to do. There was that look, I, that quote I read of her looking around the room with that scowl of disapproval that cowed the furniture. I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a definite sense of stern, forceful, powerful disapproval of the life that she finds herself, of her, the household that she finds herself surrounded in of her parents' behavior. But at the same time, the thing that Anu was describing of instead of blaming them or being angry with them about it, just a sense of like, you know, pulling herself together and like, you know, because that's how it is, I have to take responsibility for this. So there's, 
that purity seems to make her generous to a fault, like not blaming anybody else for her circumstances, um, always taking things on herself, always taking responsibility for everything herself. And not a stoicism because there's still that innocence in her. There is kind of a um, an acceptance of the way things are, but not an acceptance without strong feelings about it. A blighted one. She's like, it's a blighted star. We yeah. that's it's that's the way that things are here on this blighted star. Is that father is a drunk um mother just kind of follows his lead and I kind of have to take care of of you guys mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. how I know it's a blighted star because if it weren't things wouldn't be like this right well I think that is it's been an hour and a half and that was a great way to sum up everything we just <laughs> talked about so I think this is a good place to stop um the assignment which I will send out as an email and post in the Facebook group is to finish phase the first, the maiden. Um, so it's another 45, it's a 45 page section, a little bit longer than the one we've read and it's chapters um, chapters uh, five through 11. Got it. And we will meet, I suppose, in Joseph's Zoom room. <laughs> we'll send out the link for that um, prior to next Sunday at 8 a.m. Okay, this was really fun. Lisa, thanks for inviting me to do this with you. Oh, it was great fun. Thanks everybody for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.